Welcome to the Radiology Review Podcast, your on-the-go source for radiology education with your host, Dr. Matt Covington, a board-certified radiologist. Please follow the podcast on Twitter at RadRevPodcast. Send emails to theradiologyreview at gmail.com or visit the website theradiologyreview.com. Welcome back to the Radiology Review Podcast, your top free on-the-go source for radiology board review. On this episode, I will conclude my three-part series of nuclear cardiology. On this episode, I will talk about cardiac examinations that include MUGA exams, sarcoid imaging, and amyloid imaging in terms of nuclear cardiac imaging. I will post a free downloadable study guide covering content from episodes 1 to 3 on nuclear cardiology that you can access for free on my website, www.theradiologyreview.com. As a reminder, follow at RadRevPodcast on Twitter and Instagram, where I am currently posting on a near-daily basis tips for the physics portions of radiology board examinations, Without further ado, let's get into the questions and answers for this episode. First question, what is the primary purpose of a MUGA scan? That's M-U-G-A, MUGA scan. The primary purpose of a MUGA scan is to provide an injection fraction calculation. MUGA stands for Multi-Gated Acquisition Scan, and uses gating to provide evaluation of cardiac function and contractility following equilibration of radio tracer in the intravascular space. Next, what radio tracer is classically used for a MUGA exam? MUGA classically uses a technetium 99M tagged red blood cell technique. So remember that technetium red blood cell scans can be used for bleeding evaluations such as with a gastrointestinal bleed, but can also be used for MUGA. Next, if you see a photopenic halo around the cardiac blood pool, what does this suggest on a MUGA scan? A photopenic halo around cardiac blood pool is a potential imaging manifestation of a pericardial effusion on a MUGA examination. That is something I would definitely be aware of, and if you don't know what that looks like, go ahead and look it up. Next, if structures such as the pulmonary artery, thoracic aorta, left atrium, or right ventricle overlie the left ventricle on a MUGA acquisition, will this falsely lower or falsely increase estimation of ejection fraction? Vascular structures that overlap the left ventricle on a MUGA scan, whether great vessels or other cardiac chambers, will give the false appearance that tracer is not exiting the left ventricle, and this will therefore lower the estimated ejection fraction. If you are asked this question on a board exam, simply think it through and realize that in this scenario of vascular overlap, tracer will not be clearing the left ventricle as it should, and this would therefore allow for underestimation of left ventricle ejection fraction. Next question. If the background region of interest is erroneously placed over the spleen, will this falsely lower or falsely increase the estimation of ejection fraction on a MUGA scan? Erroneously placing the background region of interest over the spleen will falsely increase the injection fraction calculation. The reason for this false increase in calculated ejection fraction is that there will be over-subtraction of background, that is, in the denominator of the ejection fraction calculation. Therefore, this will lower the denominator and therefore increase the calculated ejection fraction. You can either try to think this one through or simply burn into your brain that an incorrectly placed region of interest over the spleen will increase the estimation of ejection fraction on a MUGA scan. Next question. Is the tagging of technetium to red blood cells for a MUGA scan 
typically performed using an in vivo or an in vitro labeling technique. For MUGA, one can get by with in vivo labeling of red blood cells to technetium. This is different from a tagged red blood cell scan performed for a gastrointestinal bleed, which requires a higher labeling efficiency and therefore it requires in vitro labeling because in vitro labeling has a higher labeling efficiency compared to in vivo labeling. However, for the purposes of a MUGA scan, in vivo labeling of technetium to red blood cells may be used for imaging. Next. What are some key features to identify the short axis, vertical long axis, and horizontal long axis on nuclear cardiac imaging? My answer to this question is that for the short axis, look for the round donuts or ring-like configuration of the left ventricle. If you see those round donuts, that is a short axis view. For the vertical long axis, to me, this looks like an arrow pointing to the right. The apex of the heart is pointing to the right of the screen. For the horizontal long axis, look for the two parallel vertical lines, similar to the two parallel long lines of an H, as in the H for horizontal. If you see two parallel vertical lines like H, remember H for horizontal. That is not the vertical long axis, that is the horizontal long axis, and that can help you potentially get such a question right on a radiology or nuclear medicine board exam. Next, what is the leading cause of attenuation artifact on nuclear cardiac imaging? At least in terms of what is highly tested, breast tissue overlying the heart is likely the top cause of attenuation artifact. Next, what is the top cause of reconstruction artifact on a myocardial perfusion scan? Bowel or liver uptake that can steal counts away from the heart causes reconstruction artifact. Next question. What is the calculation for maximal heart rate used to determine whether somebody has reached sufficient cardiac stress for a Bruce treadmill protocol? The answer is that the calculation to estimate maximal heart rate is 220 minus the patient's age. In general, it is desirable to reach something like 85% of the maximal heart rate value during the stress portion of myocardial perfusion imaging. It is important when using an exercise protocol to ensure that the patient has reached sufficient cardiac stress to uncover any potential cardiac stenosis. If the patient does not exercise hard enough, your sensitivity for detection of coronary artery stenosis is reduced, so you need to ensure that the patient has reached sufficient stress, and one way to do that is by estimating the maximal heart rate and seeing whether the patient's actual heart rate achieved during exercise is something like 85% of their maximal heart rate value. Next question. What is the most commonly used nuclear medicine agent for evaluation of cardiac sarcoidosis? The answer I am looking for here is FDG. We all know FDG PET very well, and FDG is the agent most commonly used in nuclear medicine to evaluate for cardiac sarcoidosis. Remember, you can also evaluate for this entity using cardiac MRI. Perhaps we will get to that on a future episode, but for now let's focus on nuclear cardiac imaging. On an FDG PET-CT study, active cardiac sarcoidosis shows heterogeneous myocardial uptake. Note that unlike amyloidosis and other infiltrative diseases of the heart, myocardial sarcoidosis is typically patchy and shows patchy uptake, and this patchy involvement accounts for the heterogeneous, slightly patchy uptake seen on a positive FDG PET-CT study. A negative FDG scan for cardiac sarcoidosis would show no increased myocardial uptake of FDG. Next question. What patient preparation steps need to take place 
in order to prepare a patient for FDG PET CT imaging for cardiac sarcoidosis? The answer I am looking for is primarily dietary modification. When preparing for an FDG PET CT study for cardiac sarcoidosis, patients should generally follow a high fat and low carbohydrate diet the day prior to imaging with an overnight fast. The reason for this dietary switch to high fat, low carbohydrate foods is that this will switch myocardial metabolism away from glucose metabolism to free fatty acid metabolism. And the purpose of that is to decrease the physiologic uptake of glucose in the heart with the rationale that areas of cardiac sarcoidosis will not switch their metabolism away from glucose uptake, thus allowing maximal signal-to-noise with areas of cardiac sarcoidosis taking up the FDG, while areas of normal myocardium will take up less FDG as the normal myocardium has preferentially switched to fatty acid metabolism away from glucose metabolism. This is termed myocardial suppression, and you do need good myocardial suppression in order to get a high-quality FDG PET-CT scan for cardiac sarcoidosis. Some protocols also use IV heparin prior to imaging, as that can further suppress myocardial FDG uptake. Next question. True or false? Patients being evaluated for cardiac sarcoidosis typically complete a myocardial perfusion scan in addition to an FDG PET-CT study. The answer here is true. FDG is performed to image for inflammation related to sarcoidosis, but this does not give information about perfusion to the heart. Comparing information regarding inflammation from FDG and perfusion from a nuclear perfusion agent such as rubidium on PET imaging or a technetium-based perfusion agent allows differentiation of normal tissue from scar tissue or from areas of active sarcoidosis. This is also important to have information from both FDG PET-CT and perfusion studies to stage sarcoid because sarcoid progresses from normal which manifests as normal perfusion and normal FDG uptake, to early stage disease which has a mild perfusion defect and mild increased FDG uptake in the area of perfusion defect, and progressive stages wherein perfusion defects worsen and FDG uptake progressively gets more pronounced. Finally, end-stage fibrosis from sarcoidosis would show a severe perfusion defect with minimal to no FDG uptake. If you have questions on this, please refer to my study guide and review what is there. I have also posted a link for a great article reviewing nuclear imaging of cardiac sarcoidosis that you can access on the study guide available at theradiologyreview.com. Let's conclude this episode by discussing a few questions regarding cardiac imaging of amyloidosis. First question, what is the preferred imaging agent for nuclear cardiac imaging of amyloidosis? The answer I am looking for is technetium 99M pyrophosphate, which is sometimes abbreviated PYP. Technetium 99M pyrophosphate is the main agent used in the United States for nuclear imaging of ATTR amyloidosis. That ATTR is short for amyloid transthyretin protein, and technetium 99M pyrophosphate binds to deposited amyloid transthyretin protein, or ATTR, within the myocardium, and that increased myocardial uptake is what allows you to evaluate for cardiac ATTR type of amyloidosis. Final question for this episode. What are key features of a positive technetium 99M pyrophosphate scan for ATTR cardiac amyloidosis? The primary answer I'm looking for here is that a positive technetium 99M pyrophosphate scan for cardiac amyloidosis would show an uptake ratio 
of 1.5 or higher when considering the heart to contralateral chest uptake on a planar view. If the ratio of heart to contralateral chest on a planar view shows a ratio of 1.5 or higher, that is considered positive for ATTR deposition in the heart. Beyond that ratio of 1.5, additional semi-quantitative measures also exist and can be rated as a 0 to 3, with 0 meaning absent cardiac uptake, 1 meaning cardiac uptake less than bone, 2 meaning uptake equal to bone, and 3 meaning uptake greater than bone. But for board purposes, I think remembering the 1.5 heart to contralateral lung ratio is the most important measure to remember, and the others are simply bonus points. I hope these three episodes on nuclear cardiac imaging have been helpful for you. Thank you for listening to this episode. Remember to download the free study guide on my website if that is something that is helpful for you. You can access that at www.theradiologyreview.com. I also have other free radiology and nuclear medicine board preparation materials and resources available on my website, so check those out. Keep up the good work and study hard. Remember, you have to study really hard to succeed on radiology board exams. So prepare to succeed. I will catch you on the next episode. Content of this podcast is provided for informal educational purposes only for radiology trainees and radiologists. Medical practitioners, please make your own independent assessment before suggesting a diagnosis or recommending any course of treatment. This podcast should not be used for self-diagnosis or self-treatment and is not a substitute for independent professional medical care. Please consult your own physician regarding any diagnosis, imaging interpretation, or course of treatment.